Hi guys, it's Mr. Y. Today we're going to talk about how to interpret evolution by natural selection. This will be our final lecture in the evolution um, unit. So we're going to talk about what exactly is evolution and where can you find examples of it and what are the big conclusions from natural selection in biology and how these affect all of biological evolution and the differences between um, evolution by natural selection and evolution by artificial selection and we'll finally discuss some actual true debates about evolution uh, by natural selection and that comes down to a matter of timing. So keep in mind that the word evolution itself simply means cumulative change over time and that evolution is not limited to biology and it's not limited to any of the sciences either. It's actually things you can find outside of science that can often create the best demonstrations of evolution. Uh, here in this picture you have um, a picture of 1928 to 1947 to 1990s versions of Mickey Mouse and you can see the evolution of the character. You can see in the beginning here he actually has a very white face with actual eyebrows and no shoes and no gloves. Then slowly he builds up all the traits that you recognize today. The shoes, the gloves, the much more smiley face, and the loss of eyebrows. And notice he actually gains the eyebrows back here by the 1990s. And this happens occasionally in evolution where traits will be lost and then reacquired after um, they become advantageous once again. So evolution itself is not limited only to the sciences. It can be found in other places. Here is another example of evolution outside of the science realm. This would be the evolution of graphics, you could argue, or the evolution of designer coding, or the evolution of technology towards um, video games. But you can see, going from the 80s to the 90s to the 2000s, the graphical upgrades, the coding upgrades that would need to, to show depth, to show um, different textures or shadows. But again, evolution can be applied to things outside of the realm of sciences. In the science world, you can find evolution in just about every other science you can think of. Geology has a geological evolution that will discuss um, how rivers flow through canyon, uh, form canyons and how they gradually um, erode through these canyons and create these huge gorges, how mountains form, how the tectonic plates shift and form volcanoes and chains of islands and things of that nature. In astronomy, we uh, discuss how um, solar systems form, how gases evolve to condense and to form stars, which then once they've formed also um, pull in, in thanks to their gravity, these uh, large bodies of rocks, which eventually can become planets. And in even chemistry, you can find textbooks. This is a college level textbook about the evolution of different chemicals. In this case, they're talking about the evolution of chemicals in the atmosphere and the oceans. So keep in mind, Evolution does not apply strictly to biology. It applies to every science and to things outside of science as well. But when it comes to biology, the key word is evolution by natural selection, or as Darwin called it, descent with modification, basically inherited changes. The idea that solutions that will work, that will function, will get passed on more often than solutions that don't work or don't function. And by function, we mean function in order to increase an organism's ability to either survive or to reproduce. So the solutions or adaptations will continue to be selected for over time. They can often grow more and more complex, just like you saw with the, uh, the, the cartoons or the video game characters. And so we call these solutions adaptations. And again, they can have various degrees of complexity depending upon how long they've been selected for. So I'm going to show you an example of this in the next slide. Um, adaptations, keep in mind, are not perfect. That there's nothing that says anywhere that an adaptation that a trait a creature has to help it survive or reproduce is guaranteed to work. It's just that they tend to work more often than they don't, and at some point they has an advan advantage in having that adaptation. It doesn't mean it's guaranteed to work. So no adaptations are perfect, but they do overall generally help the creature to survive or reproduce more often than not. So here we have the growing complexity of an adaptation of an eye, and this is tracing them through mollusks, um, 
I should say, uh, uh, non-vertebrates. And you can see in this slide here, you have just a layer of pigment cells, photoreceptive cells, that can basically just say, okay, you're either in the light or out of the light. And this is probably for an organism that needs to know whether it's in the light or out of the light based simply on um, the idea that it has to do photosynthesis. Um, here you can see the cells have formed into kind of a cup shape and this would be an optic cup like you would find in a starfish that ha has at the ends of each of, arm each of its arms and again um, being able to tell whether you're in the light or out of the light is one thing but also being able to tell what direction the light is coming from is another thus you get this little formation of a cup and you see that increase on the next part where you see it's much more rounded in the shape and again you can get a better sense of direction of which way the light is coming from if it's to your left or to your right this is with a nautilus's optic eye that's this guy down here um, again it has to be able to tell which direction it's swimming and then the next slide you see now it's a full-blown eye um, completely separate from the outside with a refractive lens this is a marine snail eye again can tell direction and it has a certain amount of focus to it but the focus is at a very specific distance only uh, beyond that distance or too close it may not be able to see clearly and then you get to something as complex as an octopus eye which very much like a mammalian eye has lots of nerve fibers connecting it here and you can see the increase of nerve fibers from each stage and in addition the cup is completely isolated it has a refractive lens it also has an iris and a cornea which means this thing can focus in at objects at very different distances and keep in mind octopuses are predators they have to be able to focus in on their prey species whether it's a foot in front of them or whether it's two feet in front of them or whether it's 10 feet in front of them so being able to focus more makes uh, the need for complexity go on so the eye itself did not evolve straight to this no it starts off very simple and then grows in complexity stages at a time now what biological evolution means basically is that if you go far enough back into the past all life at some point shares common ancestry hence there's a big conclusion out of this the idea that life has arisen once on earth and that after forming evolution by natural selection takes over and produces the variety we see today and that we also see in the fossil record keep in mind a lot of the variety has died out because of mass extinctions and this leads to the conclusion of what we call the tree of life and you guys have probably heard of this notion before and we'll talk about how that notion has changed for you guys and the idea and this is a very simplified version of the tree that there's basically three main branches based upon your cell types you have the two prokaryotes these guys the bacteria and the archaea which have no nucleuses to speak of um, and then the eukaryotes the animals the funguses the plants and the protists um, and the funguses excuse me i forgot about that and our understanding of the tree of life has changed as we've learned more and more about genetics so our actual understanding of the tree of life itself has evolved just as as you're learning about it has evolved so here's four big conclusions from the idea of evolution from natural selection in the next two slides i'm going to go through each of these four if you want to pause the video here and take notes just from this slide that's fine you can just listen to the next two or if you want to just watch the next two and keep taking notes from there it's going to be the exact same stuff so big conclusion number one the idea that the environment picks the best adaptations for creatures to survive and reproduce again the environment decides you're going to need to be able to camouflage yourself or be faster or be able to hide yourself or be able to focus on things at a very far distance so it's the environment that selects for adaptations and keep in mind in truth it's actually the past environment because life itself takes a little while to catch up to the demands of the environment so if the environment changes too quickly that can lead to extinctions and that's what we've seen with every case of mass extinction the environment changes very very fast and life simply cannot evolve as fast and tends to die out as a result and because of this idea that all life at some point has a common ancestry again all life is made of cells all cells use dna all life needs water all this stuff that every single living thing on the tree of life needs it's this idea that the tree of life has one trunk one starting point one origin point and only one the other big conclusions the idea that on the tree of life 
the less time two organisms have diverged um, evolution-wise from each other, the more similar they should appear. So for instance, you would expect to find more similarities between a segmented worm and things like mollusks than you would say between a mollusk and something way over here like a frog or a newt. So the more recent the common ancestor, like with these guys right here, they have a common ancestor somewhere around here before they start to diverge from there, the more similarities they're gonna have, the more time apart they are from each other. So if the common ancestor is way back in time back here, to say, again, the frogs and the newts, the more differences you're gonna see, again. And so the more differences, you can make this generalization You sometimes, the more differences you observe between two organisms um, usually means the more distant past the common ancestry tends to be. Not always, but usually it's a nice generalization based upon evolution. And the last conclusion, again, the idea that evolution is not perfect. As I said before, if the environment changes too fast, that will cause mass extinctions. And one of the more interesting facts in biology is the idea that 99% of all species, whether it's a bacteria, plant, animal, fungus, whatever, that has ever lived on the earth has already been here and gone extinct. What we see today is less than 1% of all the variation that has ever lived. So evolution, believe it or not, actually doesn't have that high of a success rate. It's still around, but oftentimes the, the environment can change so fast that evolution by natural selection doesn't work in time and this species tends to go extinct. The last big conclusion, um, the idea that this process of evolution by natural selection does take time. And we know from half-life records that this takes on the order of billions of years. Darwin was one of the first biologist to push the idea that the earth was a couple hundred million years old. He did some basic calculations, but thanks to things like half-life calculations, we now know the earth's age at about 4.5 billion years. Again, uh, the conservative, conservative estimates in Darwin's time was about 400,000 years old to only about a million years old, and we now know that earth is far, far older than that. And we need that time for evolution by natural selection to, to work towards this process. Now, in middle school, when they talked about the tree of life, they probably showed you some um, uh, pictures like this, or maybe in elementary school. Again, you're just showing basic connections, and it's a very simplified version of the tree of life that this is showing. And you can see, even Darwin, this is his own notes from his travels to the Galapagos, was concerned with how things connected to each other. What was the relationship between A, B, C, and D here? And which one had the more recent common ancestry? between them. But our knowledge of the tree of life has evolved greatly even since Darwin's time. So we've gotten more knowledgeable based upon the genetics that we've learned about. Here is a more um, standard high school version of the tree of life. You have to think of a tree if you were like a bird flying directly over the tree, uh, above the tree. So here would be the trunk, the origin of all life. And then again, you have the three main branches, the archaea, the bacteria, and the eukaryotes. These guys both being prokaryotic and then you have the eukaryotes over here that would include the plants, the animals, um, the funguses, and things like that. And then just to give you the idea of how much more prokaryotes there are, more bacteria there are in the, in the world than there are eukaryotes, this is a college level version of the tree of life. Again, the origin point would be right here in the center. The eukaryotes are here to here. And then all the rest of this is different types of bacteria, and these are just groups of bacteria. So the complexity of the tree of life has increased as we've gotten more knowledgeable, discovered more species, and used genetics to determine the relationship between those species. So for your guys' sake, biological evolution means that all living things share some form of common ancestry, and that the more recent the common ancestor, the more similar the species should be both behaviorally and physically such that if I gave you three species, these three species here, a deer, tiger, and lion, I said, okay, which two of the three do you think has the more recent common ancestor? It should not be that hard of a thing to figure out. The idea that a tiger and a lion share a recent ancestor, I should say share an ancestor more recently with each other than they do with a deer 
should not be that hard of a guess. Now, keep in mind, all of them have a common ancestor of mammalian uh, heritage. That is to say, they all have fur, they all are endothermic, they all produce milk, they all give birth to live young, so they're all mammals. So at some level, they all do have a common ancestor. And of course, they're all animals and stuff like that, but mammals is the more specific group. But this idea that tigers and lions, because they are cats, they are predators, they share ancestry more recently closer to the present day than either of them share with something like a deer. And keep in mind, in this example, it does not matter where I put the tiger or the lion. It could be reversed, and it's still the same exact diagram. Um, I'm going to go on to the next slide and explain a little bit more. So based on just this diagram alone, just the interpretation, we would say that tigers and lions share a common ancestor more recently than either of them share with the deer. And hence, we expect tigers and lions to be more similar, to behave more similarly, to be more physically similar, since they've had less time to evolve apart from each other. Now, I'm going to give you another um, slide to try on your own using these three animals, and I'll show you pictures of them to clarify what they are. So here we have an ostrich, a toucan, and a cassowary. All three are birds. And what I would like you to do is, using the diagram over here on the right, see if you can figure out which two of the three have the more recent common ancestor and then place the names in the correct locations, please, on the diagram. And keep in mind, the past always goes on the bottom and present day always goes on the top. So if you figured it out properly, you may have gotten something like this, where the toucan is the outlier. The toucan, obviously still a bird, and you could say that they all have a common bird ancestor. But the toucan is obviously more different than the other two. And because it's more different, that means its ancestry must be further back in time. It's not as recent as the ancestry between an ostrich and a cassowary, since both of those are non are flightless birds. You can see they tend to be um, they actually tend to be a bit more predatory. Toucans are herbivores; they eat only fruits and nuts, hence the big beak. But what we would say is that cassowaries and ostriches have a common ancestor more recently with each other than either of them shares with a toucan, which would have been right here for all three, and then right here for these two. And again. You could have this same diagram and have switched the, ostr the ostrich and the cassowary and still been correct. It doesn't matter which one of these two goes to which one as long as it's these two here and the toucan is the fellow with the more distant ancestry between all three. Now, let's clarify a difference that Darwin found when he was uh, first coming up with his ideas of natural selection. Keep in mind, we define natural selection as the process by which favorable that's to say advantageous, heritable things that you inherit. So favorable, heritable traits become more common and unfavorable, heritable traits become less common. So traits that don't help you to survive or reproduce become um, unfavored and become less common in the natural world. And Darwin originally got to this idea because he was watching things that were ha happening thanks to man-made effects. He was watching what he called artificial selection. He saw in England the breeding of dogs for certain traits and features in, in some cases. He also had grown up on a farm, so he knew all about how farmers uh, worked with things like pigs, cows, um, crops. Any kind of farming uh, concept was very familiar to him. And so the intentional breeding by people for certain traits is what he called artificial selection. And we see this, as I said, in dogs. You have lots of different breeds of dogs. Some are bred to be like guard dogs, and some are bred to be little lap dogs. And keep in mind, this is all based upon breeding from an ancestral species of wolf. Whereas um, horses, cows, corn, they're all bred for different purposes. Um, and Here's an example of an ancestral species of horse. Actually, I shouldn't say ancestral species, an alternative species of horse that's a wild species. This is called Przewalski's horse. It lives in China and in Mongolia. And this has never been bred by people. And you can see it's very different 
than um, a modern horse you would find on a farm. It's much smaller, much more shaggy, and you can see if it resembles anything, it actually resembles the only other horse species that we have not um, in artificially selected for. That would be the zebras, and you can see these guys have a nice spiky mane just like zebras do. Um, but we've bred horses to be bigger, in some cases stronger, to be pull horses or work horses or war horses. We've bred all of that into different animals, and basically any crops you find on, on farms have been bred from ancestral species that are usually very different from what you see. So here's an example of what I mean. Uh, here on the right hand side, we have a picture of corn, of course, with the cob, and you can see the ears here growing at various locations. They would grow at different places on the stalk of the corn. And here we have teocyte. That is the actual ancestral species of corn, and you can see the actual, what you would call cob or ear, um, is much, much, much smaller than what you see today on modern farms. We have bred the largest, um, for the largest kernels, the larger cobs, and bred them to actually be grown at different locations on the stalk. And to have less space between them, we've bred away this idea of them needing branches so that we can fit more corn into less space. Uh, this is a nice slide because, again, this shows how artificial selection can make things appear different. At the top, you might think that's a house cat. In fact, it's actually a wild species of cat that's the African wildcat, and it comes from Africa. Lepica is from Liberia. That's a uh, rodent hunter, and the idea is that uh, people took this wild species and domesticated it. That is to say, they bred it for their intentional usage to help um, save grain stores, to help hunt rodents that were eating grains. So you breed this species that you know, will be submissive to you, but will still hunt rodents, and that's the idea behind household cats. On the bottom here, the bottom left, you have red jungle fowl. And if you look closely, it shouldn't be too hard to see from this picture, especially what this is the ancestral species of. This is chickens. And you can see the hens here, while not as colorful as the male counterparts, they're not nearly as fat as you would see in today's modern uh, grown chickens at a farm. They're not, they haven't been bred for meat in any way. But the roosters still very much look the same. On the right, I like to test you guys on this one to see if you can figure out what crop this is. Um, most people would tend to guess that this would be a type of grape. And while it is a vine species, there's vines here, this is not grape, this is actually tomatoes. tomatoes. I think I spelled that wrong. Um, but yeah, you can see they're not red in any way. They, they're not nearly as big as a modern day tomato. Um, but they've been bred to be that big, that red, that reddish color when they turn ripe, so farmers know when to pick them. Um, and again, ancestral species turning into um, useful tools for people, that's an example of artificial selection for all three of these cases. So the idea of um, creating new species because of human interventions is pretty natural, and Darwin understood that. What he had trouble and what took him a long time to truly figure out and understand was the idea of how would this happen in nature? And it comes down to a basic concept, the idea that you first need to have reproductive isolation. That is to say you have to have a group of the species somehow get isolated from another group, and then over time the differences will accumulate between the two groups, and thus you get new species. Now the reproductive isolation, meaning they can't intermate, might happen because of the geography, like Darwin saw in the Galapagos. Or it might happen because there's a slight change in behavior. Something goes on with the behavior where one maybe one takes on a different trait to its mating properties, like a mating dance for a bird that's different than another's, and then suddenly you're reproductively isolated. Or it can become an example of temporal isolation. That means an isolation based upon time. So maybe you're active during the nighttime where another group is active during the daytime and that leads to, once again, reproductive isolation. And all this can lead to speciation, new species evolving. And keep in mind, the idea of speciation is this concept that there's a common ancestor and somehow you get reproductive isolation, either because of geography, behavior, or, or differences in um, time, and something causes 
a difference. And those differences begin to build up again and again and again over time until the two different populations become so distinct they can no longer interbreed. Remember, the definition of species that I want you guys to use is the idea that they have to be able to interbreed and produce fertile offspring. But at some point, the differences become so much that's no longer possible, hence you get two new species. So speciation itself is defined as the evolution of two species from one ancestral species. And as I said, Darwin saw this. He saw this because of geographic isolation. He didn't know what he was seeing to begin with, because remember, he traveled to the Galapagos and he saw this weird bird that looked like a cormorant, but couldn't fly. Whereas the ones he saw in South America could fly. And he had seen both types. And he said, well, what's wrong with this population here? Well, he wasn't actually looking at a different population. He was looking actually at a different species of cormorant that had been isolated on the islands for so many generations. They had lost the ability to use their wings for flying because all they really needed to do was swim. Again, it can also happen because of specializations in behavior. Again, behavioral isolation leads to reproductive isolation. We know from genetics that the family of owls, owl birds, are actually most closely related to falcons. And the more um, uh, likely theory is the idea that there was a group of falcons who started to specialize in hunting only at night. Falcons tend to hunt in the day and night. Well, when you have a group that specializes only at night, they're going to become reproductively isolated if they're only awake at night and they're only active at night, whereas they're sleeping in the day and falcons can be up in either day or nighttime. And again, owls have many adaptations falcons don't for hunting at night. They have very, very, very different types of feathers that are very whisper quiet, so you can't hear them fly. Of course, their face, the feathers on their face have been evolved to focus sound directly into their ears and they can twist their head an incredible amount around their neck so they can just turn their head and listen very carefully without actually having to move their whole body another uh, silence adaptation when hunting for predators at nighttime so <clears throat> i want to go through this slide um, i may have done this on another lecture i'm not sure but i want to make sure i'm clear with you guys the ideas that darwin was aware about and the ideas darwin didn't know about that we now know that actually do support the um notion of evolution by natural selection. So Darwin knew that the fossil record showed massive amount of extinctions. He knew the environment had somehow changed too quickly for species to cope with it, that they had died off. He also knew that the deeper in the ground you go, the more fossil, the different, the more different the fossils appear, excuse me. He knew about the patterns of the timeline. He didn't know anything about half-life or how to actually judge the age of the fossil. Nobody did at that point. Half-life and radiation hadn't been discovered. So knowing the exact age of the Earth was a rather complex task to try and calculate out. He knew that if you looked at the embryos of certain creatures, you would find um, vestigial organs, organs that would disappear, that appear to show that they had somehow had a practical application, but somehow they were never used. Um, for example, the little leg bumps on snake embryos. He didn't know about the comparative biochemistry aspect. Again, nobody knew about uh, DNA or genes at the time. You could, nobody could tell how close a DNA strand was from a mouse to, a, to a, another type of rodent. Um, he only knew that parents tend to produce kids with similar traits to themselves. Somehow traits were being passed on. Not 100% identical, but just enough to um, promote characteristics of survival and reproduction. He knew that there were vestigial organs on creatures, and he knew he could find examples of um, homologous structures like wings of different birds all functioning for flight, even though they had slight differences like the owls and the falcons. And he knew about analogous structures as well. But he didn't actually know the full scope of how speciation worked. He knew geographic isolation could lead to speciation because that can lead to reproductive isolation because of his time on the Galapagos. He didn't know all about it, though. He didn't know about the different varieties of behavioral isolation or temporal isolation. So he had some concepts of it, but he, to actually understand how it all worked was something that was just a little bit beyond him because there wasn't enough research on it at the time. He did, however, make the idea that nature was pushing for um, 
adaptations to help creatures survive and reproduce thanks to his studies of artificial selection. He knew how people selected for different dogs or different horses or pigs or, or farm plants, farm crops, and he said, oh, that's going to relate back to nature. So one of the more interesting debates about evolution and natural selection is not so much did it happen, it's how fast does it occur? And there's two predominant theories. One is called gradualism. This is one that Darwin tended to support. And the other more recent one is called punctuated equilibrium. And there's actually evidence for both. That's why the debate has never been solved. And it really tends to depend on what species you're talking about and the fossil record of that species. So gradualism is the slow, gradual change of a species with many what we call transitional forms in the speciation process, meaning you have lots of fossils. You can think of gradualism as a kind of ramp from one species to another. Whereas punctuated equilibrium is a process where you have lots of little slow, gradual changes interspersed with rapid periods of evolutionary change. And because of this, you can expect fewer fossils, fewer what we call transitional forms. So you can think of punctuated equilibrium like a staircase, whereas you have periods of very little change, little change, and then you have these little spots where something in the environment clicks very fast, and then it's a very rapid evolutionary change. And because it's so rapid, the odds of producing a fossil in that case drop really, 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 really low. So we get fewer transitional forms, fewer fossils during these periods of fast, rapid change. Whereas here, the likelihood of finding a fossil at one point versus another point versus another point is essentially equal because it's taking such a long time. And this can explain certain um, problems we see in fossil records of certain species. But again, there's evidence for both of these. Pictorially, I would like you to copy down this uh, picture because it shows the differences in these models. Um, you don't have to color it, but it does show how you have gradualism over here and punctuated equilibrium. And again, gradualism is slow buildup of changes over time to create new species. Whereas punctuated equilibrium, you have very little change. Here would be like the flat part of the stair. And then very rapid change over a very short period of time. And again, very little change, and then very rapid change, and then very little change. So you expect to find fewer fossils with punctuated equilibrium because there's uh, been a lot of change in relatively short amount of time. And again, there's evidence for both of these. It just really depends on what species you're talking about and how good the fossil record is. Um, it really depends. We know, for instance, that gradualism is a model that works very well for explaining the evolution of um, the, horse, the entire horse family from an ancestral species of deer, believe it or not. And punctuated equilibrium works very well for explaining um, how you go artificially, I should say, from a ancestral wolf species to different breeds of canines, different breeds of dogs. So there's evidence for both of these. Um, it really tends to depend on which kind of species you're looking at.